Greetings, electrical friends. For the longest time, transmission lines were kind of a mystery to me. And after a couple of days of intensively studying things about transmission lines, they're still kind of a mystery to me, but less so. It's chip tips, chip tips. I have no music and I can't sing. A transmission line is two conductors separated by some non-conductor. So, for example, this is a transmission line. Here's another transmission line. Here's a bunch of transmission lines. This is an Apple IIe, and these are the slots on it, and there are signals running back this way, and there's a ground plane. So there's a ground plane, there's a trace, that's a transmission line. Here is another example of a transmission line. This is just some random board. Um, and there are some traces over here, and there is no ground plane on this board, but there are ground traces. So, of course, there's going to be some sort of electrical field between a trace and ground, or a trace and power, or even between power and ground, and that's a transmission line, because it's two conductors separated by a non-conductor. So here's a diagram of a transmission line. And what we're going to do is, in order to see what happens on this transmission line kind of intuitively, uh, we're going to say that the voltage source goes from 0 volts all the way to 1 volt instantaneously. Now, of course, that never actually happens in practice. There's always some sort of a rise time. In addition, my voltage source has no source impedance, it's ideal, and I keep all of these things in the drawer next to my massless frictionless pulleys. In addition, this wire will have no resistance in it. Now we also know that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So if this voltage goes from 0 to 1 volt, and this transmission line has a certain length, well, the end of the transmission line, which I've left open-circuited here, is actually not going to see that electrical field until some time later. Now, the speed of light in a vacuum is something like one nanosecond per foot, or one foot per nanosecond. So, an electrical field can't travel more than one foot in one nanosecond. So, if this were a one foot long transmission line, then the electrical field would only be seen at the end of the transmission line one nanosecond after this voltage source goes to one volt. Now, it's a little more complicated than that because when you have something between this conductor that's other than a pure vacuum, then that's called a dielectric. And dielectrics have a certain characteristic called the dielectric constant, um, which we'll call epsilon sub r, and the dielectric constant tells us how much more slowly than the speed of light does an electric field travel down that medium. Now I have a table somewhere. Now I have a table of some typical dielectric constants. So we can see that for a vacuum the dielectric constant is 1. That's just the definition of uh, the dielectric constant for a vacuum. And uh, an electrical field takes 33 picoseconds to travel 1 centimeter. In air, the dielectric constant of air is extremely close to the dielectric constant of vacuum. It's just a little bit bigger than 1. And if you look at this equation over here, this tells us how the dielectric constant relates to the speed of an electric field. Um, what you do is you take the speed of light and divide it by the square root of the dielectric constant. So, of course, the square root of a number very close to 1 is going to be a number very close to 1. It's still going to be slightly greater than 1, so c divided by a number slightly greater than 1 is just going to be slightly less than c, the speed of light. So, for all intents and purposes, the speed of an electric field through a transmission line separated by air is approximately 33 picoseconds per centimeter. Now, the important thing that we're going to talk about is in a printed circuit board. So if you have, say, a ground plane and a trace separated by a printed circuit board, that PCB is made up of 
FR4 impregnated with glass and 55% resin. Anyway, the dielectric constant is measured to be 4.1. It's something close to four. The square root of four is two. So that means that the speed of the electric field traveling down a transmission line separated by a printed circuit board is going to be roughly half of that of the speed of light or 67 picoseconds per centimeter. That's a very important value and we'll refer to it a lot later. Uh, there's an interesting dielectric, water. If you happen to have two conductors separated by water, well the electric the dielectric constant is 78.2. That corresponds to 295 picoseconds every centimeter. That's extremely slow. But I don't really know of any dielectric made up of water, so we're not going to talk about that. But anyway, that's how the particular uh, material that separates the two conductors relates to the speed that the electric wave is going to propagate down that transmission line. So visually what's going on is this. We turn on the voltage source at time zero and it instantaneously goes up to one volt. So we got a field that goes between these two conductors and it's just a one volt potential between them and it starts traveling down the transmission line like this. Now as it travels down the transmission line, it also causes the electrons in the transmission line to move. Now one myth that I wanted to spell right away is that electrons travel at the speed of light. They don't. First of all, electrons have mass and nothing that has mass can even approach the speed of light uh, unless you've got a linear accelerator or a super collider or something like that. Uh, since we don't have a super collider, um, if we have an electron, here's a little electron, and we've got a difference in voltage potential. So for example, here it could be one volt and here it could be zero volts, which is what's gonna happen. So initially there is zero volts all along the transmission line. And then when you turn on the voltage source, you get one volt over here, and this part of the transmission line is still zero. So because of that potential difference, you're going to have charges moving. So the charges are gonna move this way, and I guess they're also gonna move this way. And that's in this part of the transmission line. In this part of the transmission line, of course, the electrons aren't moving because the field hasn't gotten to that part of the transmission line. Now, what exactly is the speed of that electron? Well, it's not the speed of light. It's called the drift speed of the electron. And in a tiny copper wire of about diameter two millimeters, that drift velocity is something like 23 micrometers per second. It's extremely slow. That's of course because a field has no mass but the electron does have a mass, and as the field goes by the electron, it sort of like wafts the electrons down the, you know, down the conductor, sort of. So um, we do get a current, and the current is related by, of course, Ohm's law. So V equals I R. Now instead of the resistance, I'm gonna talk about the impedance, Z sub zero. Z sub zero is the characteristic impedance of a transmission line. Now, if you just imagine a regular wire, you know that a wire has some sort of resistance to it. And the longer the wire, the more resistance you're going to have. Not quite with a transmission line. A transmission line has a certain characteristic impedance, which is not a DC resistance. It's actually a resistance to a change in flow of electrons or flow of electric field. And the other interesting thing about a characteristic impedance is that it doesn't depend on the length of the transmission line. It's an impedance that is characteristic of just a piece of a transmission line, no matter how long it is, if it's a centimeter long or a kilometer long. And one final interesting thing about the characteristic impedance is that it doesn't depend on frequency. Now that's not quite true because 
it does depend on the dielectric constant and the dielectric constant does change a bit with frequency, but not that much. So you could consider the characteristic impedance to be constant with respect to frequency. Okay, so this is the relationship that we're looking at. So we know that the current is going to be the voltage potential difference divided by Z0. Now for a transmission line on a printed circuit board, Z0 is about 50 ohms, it's plus or minus, but we're just gonna call it 50 ohms. So if I have my one volt potential over here and this part of the transmission line is zero volts, the difference in potential in that segment of the transmission line is one volt, so I should see a current of 20 milliamps flowing that way, and I guess flowing the other way over here. Again, this part of the transmission line does not see that current. And this is different from, you know, just a static analysis of a circuit where the current has to be the same everywhere throughout a wire. So now what's going to happen as the wave travels down the transmission line at half the speed of light, it keeps going and the electrons start moving this way and we start seeing that 20 milliamp current progressively going down the line. Okay, now what happens when the one volt wave hits the very end of the transmission line? Well, one of the problems with this is that you can't have electrons floating off of the end of the conductor. So you have to have a zero milliamp current at the end of the conductor but we've got electrons flowing this way. So what happens is there's kind of a reaction at the end of the transmission line, which forces electrons to flow this way in order to counteract the electrons that are flowing this way so that net, there's no current at the end of the transmission line. So there's no electrons falling off the end. Now, the only way for that to happen is for there to be an equivalent electric field being reflected off the end of the transmission line. Here, let's cover that up. Of exactly the same amount of electric field that's approaching the end of the transmission line. Now, why is that? Well, if you look at this, this is now two volts Okay, because the electric field goes this way and then it gets reflected back so, it's, so it adds on to itself. So we have two volts over here and one volt over here. That's a potential voltage difference going this way of one volt, which means of course that we're going to get a current going this way of 20 milliamps. Now 20 milliamps going this way and 20 milliamps going that way is going to exactly cancel out. So, of course, that wave has to propagate down the transmission line in the other direction at half the speed of light. And again, we see zero milliamps over here, but because this reflection hasn't yet gotten to this part of the transmission line, this transmission line is still seeing a 20 milliamp current going this way. So the, electric, the reflected electric wave starts traveling back and back and back. And as it travels back and back and back, it's canceling out the current that's on this transmission line and eventually it reaches the beginning of the transmission line. So now the transmission line is completely at two volts and there's no current anywhere in the transmission line, but there's a problem because the moment the reflected wave, which is now adding up to two volts, hits the beginning of the transmission line, well, we have another boundary condition that says that this end of the transmission line must be at one volt. So the only way for that to happen is for this wave to get reflected off the beginning of the transmission line like this. So it's going to reflect except it has the opposite sign. So if we add up all of this, we see one volt, two volts, one volt. So now, this part of the transmission line remains at one volt. And again, because there is now a potential difference, here is one volt and here is two volts, we get an additional 20 milliamps 
flowing this way. That adds to the 20 milliamps flowing this way and the other 20 milliamps flowing this way, which became zero milliamps. And now we've got another 20 milliamps flowing this way. So now we've got 20 milliamps flowing this way and we've got this wave traveling down the line like this at half the speed of light and the current is going this way at 20 milliamps. The current on this part of the transmission line is zero still. And when the wave hits the end of the transmission line, the same thing has to happen. We've got 20 milliamps flowing this way, but you can't have electrons getting sucked into the end of the uh, wire. So there has to be some reaction over here to cancel that out. And to cancel that out, we get another wave. Let me move this paper down. We get another wave that has equal sign that's going to reflect off the end of the transmission line. And if we look at that, and if we add this up, this is one volt, one volt, minus one volt, minus one volt, we've got zero volts over here, we've got one volt over here, so the potential difference is one volt that way, which means that we're going to get 20 milliamps going that way, which exactly counteracts the 20 milliamps going this way, again resulting in zero milliamps at the end of the line. That's great. So the reaction works and the reflected wave travels back at half the speed of light. Again, canceling out the current uh, flowing on the transmission line until it hits the end again. So we've got zero volts over here, but we're required to have one volt over here. So what happens? Well, we're back to the original situation where we have this and we get this one volt wave having to travel down the transmission line. Okay, so let's graph that. Let me get all my little pieces of paper here. So let's graph what happens at the end of the transmission line over here. So we're gonna graph the voltage, voltage at the end and this is time. So of course, uh, let's suppose that, um, let's see. Okay, so light travels at one foot per nanosecond. Half of that means one foot per two nanoseconds. And let's suppose that this is a one foot transmission line. So that's two nanoseconds. So it takes two nanoseconds for the wave to go from the beginning to the end. So at time zero, we're going to have the voltage at the end of the transmission line being of course zero because the, the electric field hasn't had time to get to the end of the transmission line. And it doesn't have time until two nanoseconds later. So this goes like this, like this, like this, like this. And then the moment that the electric field hits the end of the transmission line, well, it can't be one volt, it has to be, uh, where's my little piece of paper? Here we go. It has to be two volts in order to make sure that the current at the end of the transmission line is never non-zero. It has to be zero. So the moment that the electric field hits the end of the transmission line, we get two volts on the end of the transmission line. So let's say two volts and it goes like this. Okay, so now the reflected wave goes back to the end of the line, or rather to the beginning of the line, and that takes two nanoseconds. So at the end of the transmission line, we're still seeing two volts. Now, of course, again, the moment that this wave hits the beginning of the transmission line, we have to have a reaction in order to cancel out that voltage to make the voltage equal to the voltage source. And that travels down the line and it takes two nanoseconds to travel down the line. So finally, at the end over here, we get this uh, reflected wave hitting the end of the transmission line, which is immediately causing a reaction like this. So we see zero volts at the end of the transmission line. So let's draw that out. So here's another two nanoseconds. And now the transmission line at the end goes back down to zero.
And that pattern is going to repeat because now this wave travels back, takes two nanoseconds, and then we're back to this situation where this wave takes another two nanoseconds to get to the end and so on and so forth. So four nanoseconds here and so on. So there's two nanoseconds, this is at six nanoseconds, this is at 10 nanoseconds. So what happens is, at the end of the transmission line, you're going to see this bounce up and down and up and down and up and down, and it'll go on forever. Again, it goes on forever with no loss because these are all ideal components. So basically the energy just sort of sloshes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, forever. Now let's also look at the current um, we can look at the current, say, at the beginning of the transmission line. So in the beginning, there is no current anywhere on the transmission line. So let's draw that out. This is I uh, beginning. And this is at zero nanoseconds, so we have no current. However, you turn on the voltage source and immediately we start getting an electric field. And this part, of the, this part of the transmission line is at zero volts. This part of the transmission line is at one volt. That's a potential difference of one volt. That means that we have 20 milliamps flowing this way. So immediately we're going to start seeing 20 milliamps at the beginning of the line. Now, very quickly, of course, we realize that two nanoseconds later, this field hits the end of the transmission line, and we get a reaction at the end of the transmission line in order to cancel out that current. That reaction takes two nanoseconds to get back to the beginning of the transmission line, but immediately we get a reaction like this. So we have one volt over here and two volts over here, which means that we have 20 milliamps flowing this way. And that would be four nanoseconds later, four nanoseconds passes through zero and goes down to negative 20 milliamps. And the pattern will just repeat. So at eight nanoseconds, which is here, we do this. And at 12 nanoseconds, we get this. So in other words, the current goes this way, then it goes this way, then it goes this way, then it goes this way, forever. So that's what happens with a transmission line that has the ends open circuited. Now, we can sort of generalize. So first of all, we can see that when this wave hits the end of an open circuit, we get, because, because of the requirement that there is no current, we get an equal voltage traveling back. So in other words, open circuit equals the reflection is whatever voltage comes in. Now, this is basically a short circuit. So, um, and the reason that it's a short circuit is that we require the voltage to be something. If this were just a wire, we would require the voltage to be zero. In this case, we require the voltage to be one volt. So when the wave hits that, we get a reflection that's equal but opposite. So closed circuit equals the reflection would be negative. All right, now what happens if the termination of the transmission line were something in between an open circuit and a closed circuit? In other words, what happens if you had some load resistance, which we'll call ZL? I'm using Z instead of R because it doesn't necessarily have to be a purely resistive component, it, it's just an impedance. Well, there's an equation that we can write down. This equation is called the reflection coefficient, and it's symbolized by gamma. And that's equal to the load minus whatever the incoming impedance is, 
divided by the load plus the incoming impedance. And I'll just sort of draw that out. Here's your transmission line. And here is some discontinuity. And then here is the rest of the transmission line. And this is your load. And this is your input. So uh, this could represent, for example, two transmission lines, uh, each with a different dielectric. Or this could represent a transmission line over here and just a, you know, a terminating load over here. Or this could be a source over here and this could be a transmission line. The point is that there's a discontinuity in the impedances. So what happens is you have an incoming wave and when it hits the discontinuity, this gamma value tells you how much of that wave travels back like this and, of course, what the sign is. Now, if we do the math, we see that, uh, let's suppose that Z in is just our characteristic impedance Z zero, and then we can change Z L to be something. So let's look at the open circuit. So Z L in that case is, is infinite. So gamma is just going to be infinite infinity plus Z zero divided by infinity, whoops, infinity minus Z zero, infinity plus C zero. Well, that's just going to be basically infinity minus a small amount divided by infinity plus a small amount, which is going to just be one. So what we see is that whatever comes in is exactly whatever goes, gets reflected. And that's what we saw back here, where we had this incoming wave going over here. And then we had the reflection being exactly equal. Uh, there's the reflection right there. Okay. Now let's look at the other case, which is where the load is zero. So that's a short circuit, and that's what happens at the beginning of this transmission line. Or it could be if we shorted this, that's what would happen at the end of this transmission line. So in that case, gamma is just going to be equal to 0 minus Z0 divided by 0 plus Z0, which is minus Z0 divided by Z0, which is negative 1. So in other words, it's equal but opposite reflection. And that's what we saw at the beginning of the transmission line over here. We saw that this wave traveled all the way back. So we had basically this 1 volt. Uh, adding to the existing one volt field on the transmission line, flowing this way. And the moment it hit the short circuit over here, which requires the voltage to be exactly one volt, well, we get an equal but opposite reflection. So that's negative one volt going this way. And of course, when we hit the short circuit over here, we have a reflection of one, an equal reflection. So that's negative one volt flowing this way. And then of course, when the negative one volt hits the end, this, the short circuit over here, we get an equal but opposite reaction. That's this one volt flowing back. Now there's another special case where the load resistance is exactly equal to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Now, there are two sort of reasons that you would have that. The first reason is that you have a transmission line and another transmission line, and the dielectrics are exactly equal. So in other words, what you've done is you've basically soldered two transmission lines together. Now, intuition would tell you that there would be no reflection, right? Because there's no discontinuity in impedance. And if we do the math, we see, of course, that that is exactly correct because the load is Z0 and we subtract from that Z0. Z0 plus Z0 and that's equal to zero. So there is no reflection. The whole thing gets transmitted across that boundary. So if you have a transmission line where ZL is exactly equal to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line, you get no reflection. Another way of saying that is that when the wave hits that load, it's completely absorbed. So there's no reaction at this end, and there's no reflected wave going back that way. So there's no sloshing back and forth of energy. It's just the energy flows from one end of the transmission line to the other, and then it just stops.
and the current remains the same. That's the ideal case. Now, what happens if there's an impedance mismatch? So what's going to happen is, let's suppose that ZL, the load, is just a little bit bigger than the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Well, then the reflection is going to be between 0 and 1. So it's going to be the reflection is going to be a little bit bigger than zero. So there's going to be a little bit of reflection going back. So what's that going to look like in terms of voltage? Well, if we have one volt flowing this way, then the reflection is going to be slightly bigger than zero volts going this way. So that would look maybe something like this. So we would get zero volts at the end of the transmission line. And then because we have one volt plus a little more, you know, let's suppose it's 1.1 volt. So the end of the transmission line would see something like that. And then it would go back. It would get reflected um, with, say, negative 0.1. That would flow this way. So the negative 0.1 would travel this way, canceling out the positive 0.1, and then that would be reflected just a little bit over here. So in other words, this would be going just slightly below one volt, and then just slightly above one volt, and then just slightly below one volt, and it eventually dies out and settles down at one volt. If we, if we say that this voltage source doesn't instantaneously go up to one volt, but it actually has some sort of a rise time, then what you're actually going to see is not this sort of step thing, but you're going to see something like this. And maybe you've seen that on oscilloscopes when you measure a digital signal. And that's really the reason that you see this so-called ringing or overshoot or undershoot is because Whatever you're measuring doesn't have the same impedance as your oscilloscope probe. Or, you know, maybe the signal that you're measuring uh, is traveling down a transmission line where you are perfectly matched to your oscilloscope, but whatever is at the end of the transmission line is not perfectly matched. That's why you see this ringing. It's actually the electrical field that's bouncing back and forth. So that's what happens if the load is slightly mismatched in the positive direction. Let's suppose the load is slightly mismatched and it's a little bit less. Well then, we're going to get less than zero and something between zero and negative one. So in that case, what's going to happen here is if this load is slightly less than Z zero, then we're going to get a reaction where we get a very small negative reaction. So what that looks like is something like this. We see zero, 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 and then we get one volt minus a little bit. So let's suppose that this is, I don't know, 0.9. So it goes up to 0.9. So this negative 0.1, say, goes all the way back to the beginning of the transmission line, and it gets reflected in an equal and opposite direction. So it goes plus 1. So now we have 1 minus 0.1 plus 0.1. So we've still got 1 volt traveling down here. And then that positive 0.1 gets reflected negative back a little bit. So maybe it's 0.01 negative. So it's 1 minus 0.01. So it's going to be, say, 0.99. So in other words, it's going to slowly creep up on 1 volt. And if we consider that the rise time of the initial wave is not instantaneous, you're going to see something like this kind of like a charging curve. And it's kind of charging up the transmission line almost, but in steps almost. 
So that's basically my intuitive understanding of the way that a transmission line works and how it reacts and all the weird things that can happen on transmission lines when you don't terminate them properly. So let's take a look at a transmission line like this. So this is an Apple IIe and these are slots and we've got say address lines running this way or data lines running this way. Now, there isn't any termination on here. And if we look at this old board over here, um, we can see that there are traces, which are by definition transmission lines, and we don't see any termination over here either. Now, why is that? So let's suppose that you know, we have one of these chips here, and it's basically a driver. And we've got a wire that goes over to some other chip over here. So it's a receiver. And we have, of course, at some point, a ground. And there's the input and there's the output. And you know maybe this is like a, a clock input, right? So maybe this is a latch or a counter or something like that. And this is, this is your clock signal. So clock signal and this is your say, uh, let's make it a counter, because there's a point that I want to make. So let's suppose we launch a signal from the clock, and it goes from 0 up to, um, well, this is probably uh, CMOS um, or TTL-compatible CMOS. So this probably goes up to 5 volts somewhere. Um, so we've got, in the beginning, from 0 to 5 volts, except it doesn't look like that. No, oh, no, no. It looks like this. 0, 5 volts. Now, this has a certain rise time, and likewise, on the opposite end, it has a certain fall time. The rate at which the voltage climbs is called the slew rate, and it's measured in uh, volts over time. And you'll typically see this on a data sheet as volts per nanosecond. Uh, let me see if I have an example. Here is a 74LVT16374. Uh, and if you look at its slew rate, it's measured at um, a maximum. Well, this is an input transition rate. Unfortunately, they don't have the output um, rise and fall rate. Um, what they're basically saying is that the input um, transition rate uh, can be no uh, slower than 10 nanoseconds per volt. In other words, if it's too slow on the input, then the input you know, may actually register uh, double clocks. But we're talking about the output. Um, and I got this backwards, I guess, nanoseconds per volt. Anyway, here's the rise time and here's the fall time. And the rise time and fall time is typically taken between 10% and 90% of the full range. Now, for, t for TTL, uh, that's something like 5 nanoseconds. So between 10% and 90% is 5 nanoseconds. Now, think about what that means in terms of the length of a transmission line on a printed circuit board. Well, we know that there is 67 picoseconds per centimeter. So how long is 5 nanoseconds? Well, it's 5,000 picoseconds times, and then let's do the unit cancellation. So picoseconds goes on the bottom. 67 picoseconds, and let me pull out my calculator. So it's 5,000 divided by 67 is 74.6. Let's call it 74 centimeters. That's kind of huge. So that means that this signal over here takes... Um, if we had a 74 centimeter line, it would take five nanoseconds to get to the end. So there's a rule of thumb that basically says that if your length is greater than or equal to your rise time, then you have to start worrying about reflections. And the reason for that is that it takes too long for the signal to travel from the source to the destination and then get reflected back again. And by the time it gets reflected back, the signal has risen a significant amount, so significant that the reflection will start changing the voltage significantly.
If on the other hand, the length of your transmission line is less than the rise time, then you don't have to worry about reflections. And the reason for that is that by the time the signal reflects back from the end of your transmission line, the voltage difference that it causes is not so much and your signal has not risen very far either. So you don't really have to worry about reflections. So in this case for TTL, because we know that the rise time of TTL is five nanoseconds and that corresponds to 74 centimeters, as long as the length of your trace is under 74 centimeters, which is you know, three quarters of a meter, then you don't have to worry about reflections. And that's why on boards like this, you don't see termination because there are no traces here that are longer than 74 centimeters. Now there's another rule of thumb that has to do with crosstalk. And with crosstalk, basically you have um, you know, some other signal that's next to this signal. And what you don't want is for one signal over here to couple into this line and cause a voltage change. And the rule of thumb there is that your length has to be less than half your rise time, and then you don't have to worry about crosstalk either. Okay, so half of 74 is 37 centimeters. So as long as your length is less than 37 centimeters for TTL, you don't have to worry about crosstalk either. In other words, you don't have to worry about your traces being too close to each other. And again, if we look at, well, this is an apple, if we look at this funny board, um, we can actually see that um, the, some of the traces go from here up to here. Oh, okay. Um, how about this trace over here? It goes up and over and down. And if you measure that, that's still less than 37 centimeters. So no termination whatsoever was needed on this in order to account for reflections or crosstalk. Now, when you're talking about something like an S100 bus, if you've seen that video, which I'll link down below, um, there is basically a chassis and a whole bunch of slots like this. And this is fairly long. Uh, I don't exactly recall how long it is, but it's getting quite close to 37 centimeters. Um, it's, it's on the order of that much. And what they did over here was they did put terminating resistors on the lines that go across all of the slots. So one of the logic families that I'm working with is the LVT logic family. And I'm looking at the data sheet uh, to see if there's any rise or fall time measurements, and there aren't any. Um, and I guess the reason for that is they want you to go to the uh, maybe the characteristics guide or you know the general logic family guide. So here's one from I think Texas Instruments. This is the LVT guide um, and they do have uh, rise time and fall time but they're always for specific circumstances so you need uh, the you need the power supply voltage that you're using and they're basically saying for all output switching. Presumably for just one output switching it goes even faster. Uh, the other thing that I don't quite understand about this is that um, they usually also specify the load that you're putting on each output. Uh, so anyway, we can just use this as maybe a minimum value. So if we look at the minimum value for the rise time, we can see that at room temperature for 3.3 volts, it looks like it's about 1.35 nanoseconds. And if we look at the fall time uh, for 3.3 volts, it's slightly higher. Uh, it looks like, you know, maybe 1.7 nanoseconds. So, and this, this is actually maybe 1.3. So let's go with the 1.3 nanosecond figure. So what is 1.3 nanoseconds in terms of length? Well, 1300 picoseconds at 67 picoseconds per centimeter is, so 1300 divided by 67 is 19 centimeters, and half that is about 0.5. 
nine centimeters. So that's the crosstalk. So my lengths have to be less than nine centimeters. That's not a whole lot. There's nine centimeters right there. So if I have a bus that's, you know, say that big, uh, that's certainly going to be bigger than nine centimeters. So I'm going to have to worry about crosstalk and reflection. And in order to solve that, I need to use termination. Now, I suppose it's important to talk about exactly why we want to avoid reflections. So let's suppose that we had a source and a destination. And again, that was going to be a counter and a clock. And this is a transmission line. Now, if this counter has, say, a MOSFET input and it has essentially infinite um, input impedance, let's say, and this clock is going to have a signal and it's going to go from, say, 0 to 3.3 volts and it's going to have a rise time of, well, you know, let's call it, I don't know, 2 nanoseconds, say. So what's the uh, critical length of 2 nanoseconds? Well, 2,000 picoseconds divided by 67 is 29.8 centimeters. So let's say the length has to be less than 29.8 centimeters. OK. Now, let's suppose my length were much larger than 29.8 centimeters, or even, you know, let's suppose it approaches 29.8 centimeters. Well. Um, if that's the case, then this um, rise time doesn't really matter all that much. The point is that the rise time is fast relative to the time it takes to propagate down to the counter. So what exactly would the counter see? Well, let's actually remove the counter from over here and put the counter somewhere in the middle. Like, let's suppose this is a bus. and uh, you know, let's suppose there is some sort of an, ena an enable signal on a whole bunch of these, just as an example. Um, so we enable one, and then we send a clock pulse down the line. Well, what's going to happen at the end of the line is that that clock pulse gets reflected back, and it's going to look something like this. Well, first of all, one of the problems is, and this is a pretty important problem, is that at the end of the line, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna go above 3.3 volts, and it's gonna go up to 6.6 .6 volts, and then it's gonna go below, and then it's gonna go above, and then it's gonna go below, and then above, and so on, like this. So the first problem right away is we can see that there's this voltage spike that's being presented to the input of these chips, and that could fry the chips. So the second problem, though, is that even if the chip survives that voltage pulse, well, the threshold of the chip is probably going to be right around here, 2.0 volts. And we've just sent one clock, two clocks, uh, whoops, one clock, two clocks, three clocks. Yeah, I got that backwards. Well, anyway, three clocks uh, because of these reflections that go back and forth. So by sending a single clock, we've just clocked this thing a bunch of times. So that's obviously no good. And that's why we want termination. First, in order to prevent these um, spikes from happening. And second, in order to prevent multiple clocks from happening. Now that's what happens if there's an open circuit over here. Um, let's suppose there is, um, oh, I don't know. Let's, let's put another, um, let's put another uh, clock on the end. And let's suppose that for whatever reason, the input impedance is actually quite low. In fact, maybe it's lower than Z0. Well, in that case, the problem isn't so great. It's just that you get um, something that looks like this, rather than you know, something that looks like that. So in other words, your signals get delayed. So you can't run your system as fast. Um, but this is really uh, a bad situation to be in. This, this you can deal with as long as you're willing to deal with a slow situation. Now here's another logic family. Here's uh, LVC. And this guide does talk about termination. Uh, so basically it says, depending on the trace length, special circumstances, special consideration may need to be given to the termination of the outputs. 
and they say as a general rule if the trace length is less than four inches no additional components are necessary now i assume that they're talking about reflection uh, yeah they say if the trace length is greater than four inches reflections begin to appear on the line so now this is for the LVC family. So what does that actually mean? Well, what they want is they want the length to be less than four inches. And then let's translate that to centimeters. So four times 2.54 is 10.16 centimeters. And 10.16 centimeters times 67 picoseconds per centimeter. Oops, that was divided by. Okay, obviously I'm having technical difficulties. 10.16 centimeters times 67 picoseconds is 680 picoseconds or 0.6 nanoseconds. So with LVC, they're basically saying that they've got a rise time of 0.6 nanoseconds. 0.6 nanoseconds, which corresponds to 10.16 centimeters. So again, what they're saying is that if you have anything bigger than this, you have to start worrying about reflections. And if we take our crosstalk issue, you have to go down to here. So let's look at some uh, terminations. So here they publish a bunch of terminations. So this is the typical termination where you've got your, um, you've got your transmission line, which is uh, your characteristic impedance of Z0, and then you've got a single resistor at the end. And here's an alternate uh, version where you've got two resistors, one going to plus and one going to minus. Now, the problem with that is that when you have a driver and you have your transmission line and then you have a resistor to ground and there's your input, the problem is that if this stays at say 3.3 volts and say you've got a 50 ohm termination over here, well, if this thing is at you know just no signal DC 3.3 volts, then you've got a current flowing here constantly. And that current is going to be, let's see what it is. So 3.3 volts divided by 50 ohms is 66 milliamps. 66 milliamps is quite a lot, so you need a pretty strong driver over there. And if you have the double termination, so going up and going down, and let's say instead of, um, well, let's say it's 100 ohms over here and 100 ohms over here, uh, because in parallel, they're gonna form 50 ohms, and that's what really matters for the transmission line, uh, because to the transmission line, this is gonna look like AC, not DC. So this is gonna be properly terminated for reflections, so it's reflection proof, but again, uh, here's 3.3 volts, here's 3.3 volts. And if this remains at 3.3 volts, well, then you need uh, 33 milliamps this way. And if this is at zero volts, then you need 33 milliamps this way. So again, this still has to be quite a strong driver. So in this case, you're wasting power um, on the positive side. Um, if this is zero, you're not having any current at all. And with this double termination, you're using less current on each side, but you know, still overall, um, 33 milliamps one way and 33 milliamps on the other way. So it, again, it averages out to 33 milliamps. So you're wasting power on both sides. So the next type of termination that they talk about is this RC termination. Now with an RC termination, you have your driver and you have your input over here, and you have a resistor and a capacitor to ground. And the resistor is going to be 50 ohms and the capacitor is going to be whatever it is. Now to AC, this capacitor is not going to even be there. So the transmission line looks like it's properly terminated. For DC, 
So if this is steady at 3.3 volts, or if it's at zero volts, then, well, the capacitor looks like an open circuit. So there is actually no current flowing. So that's pretty good. The problem is that this forms an RC low pass filter, which means that in terms of your frequency, um, this is what the characteristic is gonna, gonna look like. So in other words, you're gonna be frequency limited. So what this actually means is that your edges are gonna be spread out because you know, an edge will have a certain frequency spectrum and you're cutting off the high end of that spectrum, so your edges are gonna sort of smear out. And also you can't go as fast. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, here we have another type of termination. This is a Zener diode at the end. And the idea behind that, I'm sorry, that's a Schottky diode. No, that's a Zener diode. Is it a Zener diode? I think it is. Well, it's some sort of a clamping diode anyway. Um, the point is that Kind of looks like a Schottky diode to me. So the point is that what this does is it doesn't actually terminate the line, but what it does is it prevents this sort of overshoot from happening. So you know the wave flows this way and then the reflection flows back that way at double the voltage. And what this is supposed to do is, let's suppose this is a 3.3 volt Zener, then what this is supposed to do is um, as the voltage rises and then it goes above 3.3 volts because of the reflection, all of a sudden this line gets short-circuited uh, down to 3.3 volts, so the reflection cannot go above 3.3 volts. But um, the other problem is that this Zener diode has to react very, very quickly, um, and that's kind of expensive and hard to find. So there's this final type of termination called series termination. Now what series termination looks like is this. We have a driver which has some sort of source resistance already. Let's call it RS. And then we've got a series resistor. Let's just call it R. And then you've got your line, which is Z0. And then you've got your receiver over here. Now, if the resistance over here is equal to Z0, then you have a properly terminated line. There is just a bit of an issue here. So because this is actually on the source, what it's going to look like is this. So you have Z0 over here, and then you have your transmission line over here. And then let's suppose this is just you know, an open circuit because you know, maybe there's just a, a MOSFET input over here with uh, no input impedance, with infinite input impedance, say, for example. So what's going to happen is that when this thing goes up to 3.3 volts, then over here, this is basically looking like a voltage divider. So you're only gonna see 1.55 volts over here. So you're going to get 1.55 volts traveling towards the end of the line, and then that gets reflected back to form the 3.3 volts that you wanted in the first place, 3.3 volts. So the thing is that if the logic threshold of this is two volts, 2.0 volts, then when the wave travels this way, no receiver that's connected over here is going to get triggered until the wave bounces back off against the end of the line, then the receivers get triggered. And the funny thing is, is that they get triggered in the reverse order from where they are uh, in distance from the source. So they get triggered back to front. And again, this relies on the reflection to go back. And the advantage of this is that no power is wasted if this voltage source is simply stuck at 3.3 or at zero because, well, there's no termination over here, so there's no resistor. So that's kind of a, a nice way to handle the case where you've got basically a bus full of receivers. There can be as many receivers as you want 
and not have to worry about terminating the end. In fact, what you're relying on is the reflection. And then the question is, you know, now that you've got this wave traveling back and it adds up to 3.3 volts, well, what happens at the source? Well, for all intents and purposes, this is a properly terminated line because it matches the impedance. So there is no, not going to be any further reflection going back here, which reduces the voltage and then, you know, raises the voltage when the reflection comes back in to cause this sort of multiple clocking behavior. So this is pretty good. Um, there is a slight delay because you are adding resistance to the line. And of course, the more devices that you add, the more uh, capacitance that you add to the line, which means that um, you're not going to be able to run your system as fast, but overall, you're not wasting any power. So this is pretty good. Now, what I'd love to do is get a printed circuit board that has um, you know, a long distance um, and let's suppose that we were using um, um, and let's suppose that we were going to use one of the LVT chips. So you know we have this uh, rise time of 1.3 nanoseconds. So we need to make sure that the length of the line is under, I think I said nine centimeters. So it'd be nice to have something like a you know, I don't know, 12 centimeter or 15 centimeter printed circuit board printed up with an LVT uh, chip on one end and uh, another counter chip on the other and just start sending pulses without any resistor and see what happens. Well, actually, I know what's going to happen. It's going to fry the, <laughs> it's going to fry the, uh, the, the component. But, you know, assuming that I don't fry the component, see, just see what happens to it. Uh, you know, and maybe actually observe this double clocking event. Uh, and then I can replace that zero ohm resistor that I'm going to put in series with a proper termination resistor. Now, with LVT, um, you're not going to have 50 ohms in the driver. So this source is probably going to be something like 20 or 30 ohms. So all I'm going to need is about 20 or 30 ohms over here. And it doesn't have to be exact. Um, because if it's not exact, I, I am going to get a little bit of reflection, but it's not enough to exceed the threshold uh, that would be required for double clocking. So it would be kind of nice to have such a printed circuit board and to just, you know, test it and just start sending clock pulses and see and make sure that I get one clock pulse every single time that I send a single clock pulse. But that'll take some time and I have run out of time for this video. Boy, this video sure took a long time to make. Um, this is the third time that I've made this video, and each time I think I got better and better at explaining the, the various issues and, you know, using these pieces of paper to, you know, show what happens with the fields. So it took three times as long to do this, um, you know, and we're talking about like six or eight hours of, of time to do this, and it's, it's kind of... Um, it takes a lot of energy to do that. So if you'd like, you can go to my Patreon and you can look at the link down below. And what that does is it keeps me motivated to make more of these videos. And I, I kind of like making these videos, which, you know, sort of educate you. And the reason that I make this particular video is that I am planning on using um, a particular um, family of logic on a bus. And so I ran into this transmission issue um, this transmission line issue. So I did want to make the video and I suppose what I could have done is just work through the problem myself and then just, you know, do the solution. But I thought it was interesting enough to share. So uh, please consider becoming a patron. I, I don't, you know, necessarily want you to feel obligated to become a patron, but it, it does motivate me to make more of these videos. So anyway, Thanks very much, and I hope to see you on the next video where maybe I'll have a printed circuit board to show. See ya. It's chip tips, chip tips. I have no music, and I can't sing.